This is a production of Cornell University. Such an intimate setting for all of this as well. I, most of my settings, I talk a lot with growers, and so they could all fit right here in front of me. They don't normally sit way in the back. Because um, I generally bring things that people like to eat. Now, in deference to all the signs in here, these are visual aids today. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> later in the afternoon, when, or during the poster session, they'll be out, and you'll get a chance to taste some of these visual aids and see, see what I'm talking about when it comes to uh, breeding and, and berry. So I work in berry crops, uh, small fruits, really is what we call it. Um, raspberry, black raspberry, which is native to this region. Strawberry, blackberry, these are things people eat every day. People are very familiar with them. And of course, none of them are berries. If you remember your um, freshman biology class, plant biology, none of these are in the actual berries as fruits. But horticulturally and um, commercially, of course, they're considered berries. Um, it's a very complex group of plants. They are all in the rosaceous family, and the ploidy levels are all over the place. So from the breeding standpoint, it provides us an opportunity to experiment with many different systems of breeding. So if raspberries are the simplest, being a diploid plant, which is very nice. It's the crop we've also done most of our genomic work on because the genome is fairly simple and fairly small. Uh, strawberry is the most is very complex. It's an interspecific auto allo octoploid, two wild species that were accidentally introduced at some point in the 1700s. Um, so most of the genome work there has been done on a related G, uh, diploid species that is not used in breeding. Um, and then the blackberry is all over the place. So in the wild, you see 2n equals 2x, but you see odd ploides. Boysenberry is a 7x. It's a very common berry that people have heard of. People are like, how does it produce fruit? Well, it does because there's apomixis, pseudogamy, all sorts of strange things in blackberry. So the genome work in these and some of the other uh, genera are a little behind because they are so complex. So my program is research and extension. Um, extension is very applied aspect of my research. My research is also very applied towards the grower, towards the actual consumer. Um, we have collaborators all the way from home gardeners. I have an 85-year-old woman in, in uh, Washington who helps me test some of my varieties. She's very happy to tell her neighbors she's the first one to ever test a new variety in the state of Washington. Um, and she sends me nice letters about how it grows in her backyard. And then we have multinational corporations as well that work with us and uh, will plant varieties on a large scale for commercial markets, for shipping all over, the, uh, in this case, in Europe and, and North America. Retail nurseries, commercial nurseries. Really, in the, in the berry world, we, we work with all of these people because there are different audiences. Um, almost everybody likes berries, at least one, or one of them. And people like to eat them every day. There's growing consumption in the U.S. They're considered to be very good for you. So all of these things drive consumption and drive interest in berries. Um, we have domestic, direct domestic collaboration here in the state of New York. The New York State Berry Growers Association has a, an agreement with Cornell. They test my new material pre-commercialization so that growers can see it ahead of time and get a look at these varieties and give me feedback on them. And then we have international collaborators as well in Canada, in the European Union, Mexico. Uh, Japan has recently signed on for one of our varieties. So we see interest in berries growing all over the world. Our extension is much on the variety trials, not only my own program, but from other programs around the country and around the world, and also techno new technologies um, that make berry growing much more feasible for New York. Uh, you see these high tunnels. We've been picking high berries in that high tunnel since mid-June. Um, this tray was picked yesterday. We'll still be picking for another couple of weeks. It provides a crop in, the, in New York that you can pick for months at a time. It provides them the opportunity to get into markets for a very long time as well. Um, New York growers are very close to their consumers. They often are marketing their fruit within a day or two of when it's picked. So consumers are much more aware of the quality standards and this type of technology really increases the quality. Um, we hold grower trials or field days where growers actually come to the farms in Geneva. 
We lay out the fruit. They get to taste it. They talk to me directly. They get to see exactly how to grow it and what's available. Um, and this really brings a lot of excitement to, um, to the industry. It's really, it's, for, for me, it's very satisfying to, to interact with the growers and have them tell me, you know, my variety's doing well. That's what I like to hear. Um, sometimes they tell me they don't like my varieties. That's good to hear, too, um, although not as fun to hear. Sometimes the extension work is not as simple as it seems. This happened two day, three days after we got it set up. We had the eye of a hurricane pass over the top, kind of turned it into a, a mangled mess. Um, that was a Monday morning picture. It was a, it was a good week. <laughs> so the science behind of it. So the breeding is fairly traditional in, in berries. Um, recurrent selection. Uh, we're looking at each generation, picking out the best ones from each generation, recombinating, recomb recombining those to try and improve the next generation. Um, it's fairly straightforward, but easier said than done. As most uh, genetic theory, since everything goes back to the mid-parent, which we're trying to get everything that's better than the parents, and that's a very difficult thing to do sometimes. Um, they are generally outcrossing. They're all self-pollinated crops but they all suffer from inbreeding depression. So you need outcrossing, you need genetic diversity in order to make improvement, which then gives you things that you don't necessarily expect. Uh, black raspberry is a little bit on the outlier because it, in my theory, is that it had a genetic uh, bottleneck during the ice ages. It is localized in the northeastern United States and southeastern Canada, and it's very, very inbred as a species. So there's not a whole lot of diversity. And they do, we, we do mix up the species, especially in, in rubus. You can cross red raspberry and black raspberry. You can cross raspberry with blackberry if the ploidy's right. Um, and there are some other wild species that are used for some interesting traits. Molecular techniques, we started certainly with genetic mapping. There was no map when I started here at Cornell. Um, we, we published maps um, with disease resistance on them for Phytophthora especially. We've moved into some RNA-seq work looking at disease resistance as well, phytophthora work, looking at the differences between uh, resistant and, and uh, susceptible phenotypes. So in raspberry, on the plus side to work with, they're clonal. So when you have a plant, you can reproduce that same exact genetic plant as many times as you want. And so it makes it very nice as a model for, for working in, in this type of field. Um, that then branched into genome sequencing. There was no genome for raspberry. There was no genome for any small fruit at that time. Um, that genome then is, is finished, but not published yet. And uh, we're, we're working on getting that paper out so that we'll have more tools as we move forward. The potential for marker-assisted selection, certainly we are looking for ways to speed things up. Putting things out in the field, watching them grow for two or three years, is a very slow way to do it, especially when you have New York, where you get a 20-minute hailstorm that comes across your field in July, which happened this year. All the fruit for about three weeks was damaged. There's not a whole lot of evaluation you can do when that happens. Um, so we want to be able to, to re reduce that number of plants that are in the field, make sure the ones that we are observing actually have the traits that we're interested in. So one of my students came up with this hydroponic system. Phytophthora in raspberry is a root disease. It's very hard to observe the roots in a system like that. Um, so we came up with this hydroponic system you can see on the left, your left. Plants really like growing in the system. When you introduce the Phytophthora, the susceptible ones die, and we can look at the difference in expression of genes from these same plants before they are infected and after they're infected. Then we can also look at clonally individual varieties that have resistance and ones that don't. The resistance in the species has been very, very durable. There's a variety that's known for it. It's been released, it was released in 1908. Um, it's a very durable resistance, and we're very interested in figuring out how that works. So the genetic mapping showed there were two genes involved, two major genes, covering somewhere between 50, uh, 50 55% of the genetic variation between these two traits. And no matter how we measured it, we measured it just on a one to five scale. We measured the, the stem lesions. We measured how much of the petioles got lesions. We measured just the root score, just how dead were the roots, anywhere from a little bit alive to no effect whatsoever. 
No matter how we measured it, those two spots in the genome popped up again and again in the mapping. So we're pretty confident that there's some serious uh, genes involved, two major genes involved. Of course, there's, when you're looking at disease resistance and you're looking at root traits, there's certainly a lot of other things that go, in, go along with that. Some of the work we've done, so the RNA-seq work, we took those two when we, we compared the RNA expression before infection, after infection in a resistant variety and a susceptible variety. Uh, we've narrowed it down to a few dozen genes involved that were very highly upregulated during the process. There were some others that were very highly downregulated and we're wading through all of that data. I think there's been data overload is what we have at this point, trying to figure out um, our next target to look at. In black raspberry, we have a, pro, a, a multi-state uh, multi program right now working at black raspberry, which is a very, very minor crop, um, but one people are very interested in because antioxidant levels are off through the roof on black raspberry. It's high in fiber and vitamin B and vitamin C and all these good things, and it tastes good too, which is even better, you know. Most of these new berries, the new super fruits, you know, the acai berry, and these, they don't really taste very good. You know, aronia, you have to mix them with something that tastes good to take them. And so, to have a super fruit that actually tastes good um, would be a boon, I think, for the industry. There's some very interesting work done at Ohio State as well on black raspberries, direct freeze-dried powders on precancerous lesions in the mouth and oral cavity, uh, reversing some of these lesions. Um, lesions in the esophagus, which is esophageal cancer is one of the worst cancers uh, for fatality for mortality, um, taking powders, direct powders of black raspberries, reversing some of these lesions. So people are very interested in this crop, but it's a very difficult crop to produce in any volume. Um, and so this, we're looking at, uh, we're looking at the genetics of it in multiple locations. We're also looking at consumer preferences and chemical analysis of the fruit to see what how we can make improvements in this crop. It really has barely been scratched as far as breeding. Um, I did a study a few years ago. All the commercial varieties, the farthest one away from a wild parent was two generations. Some of the varieties were actually plants people found in ditches, and they named them, and that's considered a commercial variety. That's how new this crop is to breeding. So we think we can make some really um, great progress in a crop like this. And that's where kind of the art comes into this. Since we don't have a lot of information on a lot of these things, we have anecdotal evidence. We have direct interaction with growers. And we use this information to, to try to figure out what the consumer wants, to try and figure out what the grower wants, and try to merge those two things in new varieties. Um, you talk to people, they always say they want flavor. Um, the flavor is kind of a tough thing in, in berries and in fruit crops in general. Um, so, what is flavor? So, I assume everybody here has had an apple at some point in their life, and you know what an apple tastes like, right? So, which one's an apple? This tastes like an apple, right? Granny Smith. Of course, this tastes like an apple, too. It's an empire. This one tastes like an apple. It's a gala, but they don't taste like each other. So, which one's the apple? Well, they all are, and they not, none of them are. There is no apple flavor there's all different flavors that all remind you of what an, everybody has in their mind what an apple should be. But they have the luxury of naming them and people can say, well, this one, I like Granny Smith apples, I like Gala. Strawberries don't have that advantage. There are no named varieties in the supermarket in this country. The European market is moving to having all the varieties on the containers. And retailers here, well, producers here, are not for it. Companies like Driscoll's, Nature Ripe, they worked very hard to get their names on those, on those uh, containers, and they don't really want to. Sorry, I've been pushing buttons, haven't I? <laughs> so we work with this with, with so what, what does the producer want? Well, the producer wants big berries. Big berries pick easy, they fill containers quickly. One of the biggest cost in berry production is labor, it's all hand picked. Um, they want shelf life, they want to be able to ship that sucker from California in four days to New York City and it looks good still. Um, if it tastes good, oh, that's, that's good, but it is not the top priority. 
Uh, and my wife was, we were talking about this last night with my wife. She's like, you know, when you need strawberries for the fruit salad, you can buy any strawberries at the supermarket. You're not gonna, it doesn't matter. You're mixing them, they're going to buy them. And people do buy strawberries. We do see, though, in New York, in strawberry season, the Driscoll sales go down because people do want good strawberries and they will go out and look, find local strawberries and they will stop buying them from the supermarket when they can. So there's a lot of room, to, a lot of potential for innovation, new categories, new colors, flavor, shapes, these things are all available that have not been marketed in the supermarket. Right now the category for raspberries is big and red and the category for strawberries is big and red. And that's pretty much where we're at. Um, and there's so much more in the berry world that's available. Um, the industry can move very, very quickly as well, but it can also stand still. So when you look in a catalog, this is from Norse Farms, one of our biggest nurseries in this region. They grow a lot of different varieties. They sell them all over the country. Just in raspberries, strawberries, and blackberries, they have 64 varieties available. Because that's a lot of information for growers to take in. It's an astounding amount of information for a consumer to take in. Um, they're from all over the world, different states, different countries. Seven of the strawberry varieties were more than 20 years old. One of the raspberry varieties, the one I was telling you about, released in 1908. Still sold commercially. Um, so on so one hand, we have people willing to try new things. And on the other hand, we have people who will never try new things. They've been growing this variety for 42 years. It works for them. They're making money. I'm not going to argue with that. But there is a lot of opportunity. So, of course, this is what we'd like to see. Even for me, I still like to have a nice commercially successful variety. We want one with big red berries. People like big red berries. If they taste good, it's even better. And if we can get a good tasting big red berry into the New York market for local growers, that's a very good thing. This is Crimson Giant, one of our, our raspberry releases. This is an example of what can happen at lightning speed. So I was approached in 2007 by a company in Spain who wanted to get into berry production. They had gotten out of asparagus because the Peruvians had driven them out of the market and they were down to one product, stone fruit, peaches, and they needed to diversify. Um, so that was 2007 and 2014, they have a, about 1,300 acres of berries all of it under, pla under cover. So there's 1,300 acres of tunnels stretching as far as you can see. It's a pretty impressive thing. So in seven years, they've gone from nothing, no sales at all, to that level. This variety, we, we sent the 25 plants to them in 2008 to test. By 2009, they said they wanted to go to commercial. In 2010, they ordered 400,000 plants to plant 100 acres which will produce somewhere between a million and a million and a half pounds of raspberries, or three, and a half, three to three and a half million units, unit of raspberries, a little half pint. And they were gonna market those over a four month period. Things would go really, really fast. By 2014, they decided they didn't like the variety anymore and they're done with it. They move on to a new variety. Because they can plant the variety in April, and by October they have fruit. By the next April, if they don't like it, they change varieties or on to the next one. Things can happen really, really fast in the, in the berry world. Um, consumers change their preferences. Of course, in Europe, too, there's, there's variety name on every container. So they get very direct feedback from the consumer saying, I like this variety, I don't like this variety, and they can actually tell them which variety it is. Um, and that's, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. You know, if you're, that's the only variety you have, you're kind of stuck. But if you have the ability to change varieties very quickly, you can maybe address those consumer concerns. Or if you have a variety that no one else has that they really like, your sales can go through the roof. Um, this company sells a tremendous amount of fruit to Norway in the wintertime. And they have one variety that Norwegians really like. And when that variety hits the market, sales double overnight. Because the people are looking for it, they're waiting for it. That's the kind of thing that can happen if the marketing and the production all goes the way you want it. Uh, a new one we're coming along. Again, big red berries, we, we still, growers, even New York growers like big red berries too. But there's a lot of things besides big red berries. So we have a purple raspberry, or strawberry, that we put out a couple of years ago named Walker. It's being marketed as um, Purple Wonder by Burpee. You can see their, their page. 
They're selling it for $10.95 per plant. So they don't have to sell very many. Um, to give you an idea, a commercial nursery sells plants by the thousand, and a thousand bare root plants costs about $110. So for the same price, you can get 10 of these, or you can get a thousand commercial ones. So, and people are buying it. They can't, they can't produce enough plants. People love them because home gardeners, it's the biggest, biggest uh, hobby in the United States is home gardening. And people love new stuff. People love stuff they can't get in the supermarket. Uh, we have some new raspberry varieties becoming very popular in local markets. This nice apricot color you see here. I mean, it helps, it tastes great, but it also catches the eye. Uh, a dark berry, so that's not red in the, in the supermarket. That's overripe. But on a farmer's market stand, uh, it really stands out. People really like to taste it. Um, that's the thing in New York growers, a lot of them are directly interacting with their consumers. People are tasting the product before they get to the car sometimes, sometimes before they actually get to the counter to sell it or to buy it. And so if it doesn't taste good for New York growers, it's a big deal. You know, berries is the th third leading fruit crop in New York and people don't really think of it much, but every place you have a, a concentration of people in New York, you have a concentration of berry growers around that area around Rochester, around Ithaca, around Buffalo, around Albany, because people want fresh berries, and they want local berries. Uh, we have some nice bright yellow, lemon yellow type berries. Um, they really stand out. They taste good, they taste like, they taste like raspberries. Um, we certainly want ones that taste really good. Purple ones too. So when you cross a red raspberry and a black raspberry, you get purple raspberries. That's a category that doesn't exist in the supermarket. So as we get things that are different, if you're working with the right companies, we can suddenly get a new category, get new shelf space, and people can look for new things. Um, and it's really, I mean, from my point of view, it's very exciting. We make some of these crosses. We don't know exactly what the fruit's going to look like. Um, and it can be a lot of fun to try, see what we can get. Of course, the mythical blue raspberry flavor. <laughs> Thankfully, <it does. laughs> there are no such things. Raspberry's that color. <laughs> Uh, there's, some, there's been some pictures going around the internet every so often that claiming these are GMO raspberries, there's GMO strawberries with that same color. It, uh, they don't exist, um, so it's all, it's all urban legend. Um, they could, I guess, um, genetic transformation in strawberries and raspberries is simple, well characterized, well worked out, and not of any interest to the consumer at this time. So uh, most of the traits that have been done, disease resistance, Roundup ready, growers would like it, consumers have not wanted it, the industry has been terrified of it because of negative connotations, their markets often overseas, um, especially the frozen, and they don't want anything to do with it. So there is a bright future, I think, in berries, sorry for the pun, but uh, uh, you know, in 2002, raspberry production, fresh raspberries, the only place they took stats was in California, it was around 40 million. Ten years before that, it was around 25 million. That was kind of growth. By 2009, in California alone, it hit 350 million just for raspberries. It can grow really, really fast. Things really happen. It's backed off a little bit now as labor problems in, in California and land use issues. Production's moved down to Mexico. Same companies, same varieties, free trade, trucks come right in. So a lot of the production has moved to Mexico, where there's still over $250 million in fresh raspberries produced in California each year. Strawberries from year to year are right there with apples as far as production in, in the U.S. You know, third leading fruit crop in the U.S. behind citrus and, and grapes. Um, third leading fruit crop in New York behind apples and grapes. People like strawberries. They eat them all the time. It's about $2.5 billion in strawberries were produced in the U.S. last year, and we import more from Mexico and Canada. Uh, the local food movement, too, really is driving some of this demand for new varieties. They want choices. They want quality. Anybody can go to the supermarket and get big red berries. And we can get big red berries every day of the year. But when you want something special or you want something different, you go to the farmer's market, you go to the local market, and there's a lot of, a lot of choices and a lot of things available now that weren't available um, even five years ago. So. And with that, I'll close. I will have the berries out.
they'll become food aids after no longer visual aids during the during the poster session you can take a taste well earliness is a tricky thing because there's multiple seasons so earliness in the spring is we've pretty much reached the limit of where we can get on earliness in raspberry any earlier in the flowers get continually get killed so until we go into completely into protected culture for breeding as well it's very difficult to get earlier where we're moving earlier is in the fall crop in the in the varieties that produce fruit on their first year's growth um, we've moved into late late July early August so we can have fruit from that time until November um, if we can move that another couple weeks earlier we could even, you know, we can expand that season. And that's the season, that's the type of plants being grown in Mexico and California. Um, you plant a plant and four months later, it's flowering and producing fruit. And so if you can move that forward, you can expand your season there. There is very much. So there's been quite a bit of work on uh, chemical composition, certainly of berries, and correlation to what flavor is. Uh, it often comes down to the same two things, sugar and acid, and the ratio between the two. Um, but yet there are always those varieties that everybody recognizes as being superior. Um, and they don't seem to have a different sugar-acid ratio from most of the other varieties. So there's a lot of, we, a proposal that unfortunately was not funded had a big aspect of that in it. Um, you know, when you work with specialty crops, sometimes the resources involved to do that is are, are limited, but there is a lot of interest in that, in what flavor is, and the combination of flavor and firmness. Everybody's had a strawberry probably they've bitten into and it kind of crunched. So we, there is no limit to how firm you can make a strawberry. You can make it so it will not ripen, so that it will stay firm, you can ship it all the way around the world, but nobody wants to eat it. So where's that balance of how firm is too firm and where does the flavor come from? Um, in that combination. Because there are varieties that are so firm, you don't want to eat it, but their sugar levels are off, off the chart. So if we could back off on the firmness, the flavor would probably be outstanding. But, so there is a lot of interest, but not a lot of work, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, thank you, Corey. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.